the relationship between funders and, and grantees is incredibly important in this space because I think it's been said quite often, you know, a lot of the work we do um, just simply couldn't happen without uh, foundations and grant bodies actually kind of making it possible. Um, but also it's, it's often quite a tense relationship and often quite difficult as well. And you are, so to see things from the, the funder side of things, I think is going to be uh, really illuminating, I guess, how, you know, how they see the priorities they set and how uh, the work that these guys do can contribute towards is actually f you know, finding out how to genuinely uh, create impact. So we have probably about 35, 40 minutes maybe for this session. We have uh, Fran Perrin from Indigo Trust. We have David Saki from... Hewlett Foundation, and Duncan Edwards from Making All Voices Count. So between them, your Fran, I think you would say is quite a, you know, they give out quite relatively small amounts of grant funding to smaller NGOs. Your Hewlett Foundation often is you know, quite a large portfolio and gives kind of quite kind of large uh, grants from time to time. And then Making All Voices Count, which is a consortium of different funders together, and you know, the work that Duncan does is about regranting some of that money. So different perspectives, different funding priorities, all focused on kind of broadly transparency, accountability, good governance, and so on as well. So just to kick off, we're gonna, I'm going to pass over to Fran. We're going to have a few minutes from, from each speaker, and then a couple of questions, and then we'll go out to the audience for a bit more of a QA and a as well. I'm sure you'll all have lots of good, piercing, and very difficult and challenging questions as well. Uh, so over to Fran, who's up first. Hi, I'm Fran Parent. I'm the founder and director of the Indigo Trust, a grant-making foundation for civic tech around transparency and accountability. The first question I always get asked about civic tech is, will you fund my civic tech project? So if you want to know, um, please come and find me afterwards. Um, tweet Indigo Trust or look at our blog. We try to be very, very transparent and accessible. If you don't think we are transparent and accessible, tell us so we can do it better. Indigo funds disruptive projects which leverage the power of mobile and web technology to foster active, informed citizenry and accountable governments. Over the past few years, we've funded around 100 grants for civic tech we give up to about a million pounds a year in total, largely to sub-Saharan African organizations or international NGOs that are working in Africa. So we're, we're definitely one of the smaller of the funders on the panel. We also have a separate program for improving philanthropy itself, but I'll talk about that in a minute. We've been lucky enough to fund my society since 2009 with both core and project funding, and that supported projects including Maslendo in Kenya, a DECRO in Ghana, and the People's Assembly in South Africa, all of which are parliamentary monitoring sites. We're now very excited to be working with My Society and Hive Colab in Uganda on a user-centered design process. And that's been challenging to us as a funder. It's the first grant we've awarded, and we don't know what it's for. Um, <laughs> building impact assessment into a grant where you have no idea what the end platform will be is particularly challenging. And um, huge thanks to Paul Lenz at My Society for helping us design that. Hive Colab have used user centered design with My Society to find out local needs and priorities, to identify local partners, and they're now working on prototypes around anti corruption projects. We think this is going to be much more successful in resulting in projects that actually meet a local need rather than just what we would like people to be working on. And our assessment will look at how successful that approach is compared to our more traditional funding model. We find that major improvements in transparency and accountability rarely occur in the first year of funding. So we think our best role is funding the ecosystem in the early stage projects, giving them a chance to prove their concept in the first year, and then graduate them on to larger funders who can take them to the next step. Also helping those early stage projects meet the, the due diligence criteria of much larger funders. There are too many funders out there who claim that they fund innovation, but only if you already have a three year impact study to show them. It's worth saying that while we have a very high appetite for risk in innovation, we have a very low risk appetite for the safety of activists. So a lot of the due diligence and research we do is around, are we putting projects and activists in an unsafe situation? But we try to be quite light touch in our evaluation because it's often not appropriate at an early stage of a project. 
We measure user statistics, return visits, reports. What we don't pretend to do is prove a causal relationship between individual projects and an improving national situation because it's going to be impossible at this scale. But in anti-corruption projects in particular, it's crucial to consider whether your success depends on elite or mass usage. A small number of very engaged users which generate national press and conversation may change government more than something which is used more widely but not at the right level. Given the tiny size of the projects we fund, there's rarely budget for independent evaluation, but we really push grantees to build in a learning approach right from the start, so that at least they're starting to collect the data and it's built into their projects from the start. If we've given a 30,000 pound grant for the first year of a project, we don't know ethically what's the right ratio to then spend on evaluation. We're still struggling with that. One factor we always measure is whether our funding helps grantees get more funding from others. Two thirds of our grantees report that Indigo funding had directly enabled them to generate more and greater sources of income after our work. Um, oddly, I want to talk very briefly about marketing for impact. If no one has heard of your project, it's highly unlikely that it'll be used enough to have impact. But many grant applicants don't ask for marketing in their budgets because they don't think funders will fund it. So we now push all our applicants to include at least some marketing budget in what they do. People's Assembly, which we fund in South Africa, doubled their website and their user engagement, their return visits, just by using Google Ads. A decro in Ghana trained journalists on data journalism to help get their message out. And in South Africa, we're now funding a press consultant to help our grantees get free media. We hope that will drive user engagement in the sites and their eventual impact. Mark asked me to think about one hope or aspiration for civic tech. And my biggest hope is that as a community, we can apply the best civic tech thinking to improving philanthropy itself. Later today, Rupert Simons from Publish What You Fund will be speaking about using data to improve the impact of foreign aid, and I highly recommend it as a session. I want to see that same approach applied to philanthropy in the grant-making world. I have a deep frustration, and I suspect it's shared by many of you, that the grant funding world is a market with no information. It's like trying to do financial investment with no Reuters, no FTSE 100, and few public metrics of success. Too much of your time is wasted searching for funders and trying to navigate their Byzantine and impenetrable application processes. So help me use civic tech to change this. Look at 360 Giving, which is an initiative we've created to get grant makers publishing their grants in an open data standard. We've started in the UK, where we already have 26 foundations publishing to our standard, covering six billion worth of grants. It's interoperable with IATI, so at Indigo, we publish once to both systems. You can see every single grant we make. And I'm very pleased that the other speakers' organizations also publish to IATI. Help me educate donors on why anyone who funds transparency should themselves be transparent. Help us improve the impact of all civic tech by allowing you to concentrate on your work, not just your fundraising. Thank you. Um, so my name is Duncan Edwards. Um, I work for the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Um, and the Institute has a long history of working in applied research, theory building in uh, fields such as governance, participation and citizenship. Um, I'm the program manager for the research evidence and learning component of Making All Voices Count. The program itself started some years ago as a consortium of four donors. That's DFID, USAID, Swedish CEDA, and Amidyar Network. Um, I'm part of a implementing consortium, which is led by HIVOS, alongside Ushahidi and IDS. Um, MAVC is essentially exploring the role of technology within transparency and accountability work. And it's doing that through putting out essentially uh, what relatively small, short-term grants to organizations who are looking at using technology in these spaces. My role 
within all that is to build an evidence base on what works, what doesn't, and how and why things work. Um, so I feel I, I feel like I'm in a slightly different position to a lot of donors. I'm essentially a re-granter. Okay, so um, there's four a consortium of four donors who sit above us, and they deal with much larger sums of money than we do. Um, so it gives us a certain amount of flexibility, but we have certain constraints that are put upon us by these very different donors. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is essentially some of the observations I've made through reading through hundreds of applications that have come into MABC. Um, I also want to talk about some of the observations of things that seem to be a problem in this in this field. Um, and also like to make a few suggestions about um, approaches, roles and responsibilities of different actors in this field. So us as donors, practitioners and researchers. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about distortions. Um, it's something I've seen a hell of a lot in the three years I've been working with MABC. Um, how a donor frames a problem in a call for proposals or a competition, it's very important. You know, we all know from our own kind of lives that um, our, you know, we modify our behavior, the way we talk, the way we articulate things, depending on who we're talking to. So if you're a donor and you're framing a problem as a, uh, you know, a very technical problem, you're looking for silver bullets, you know, magic fixes for things, that's exactly what you're going to get. But um, in MABC, when, I, when I've talked to some of our grantees face to face who I've read their proposals as they've come in, and th the proposal sounds very kind of tech optimistic, it's going to say, you know, transform the world. Actually, when you talk to them, it's part of a, a very small part of a long term, very politically savvy bit of work. It's not just a quick fix. Um, so, in terms of responsibilities, I think donors have a responsibility not to be calling for magic bullets. And I also think that practitioners have a responsibility not to kind of oversell. Um, you know, in a six month, one year, two year project, you're very unlikely to transform governance. Um, and you know, let's recognize this. Governance is a long-term change process. Innovation is a long-term change process. So let's be re realistic about the kind of impacts or outcomes that we hope to see. Are you going to see a governance impact? Or do we need to be more realistic about it's actually knowledge that is more useful? So knowledge outcomes. You know, what knowledge has been produced from trying this in that context? And that being a basis for future innovation. Um, so I also wanted to touch on the role of researchers. There's lots of researchers in the room here. I work at Research Institute. Um, it's not just a researcher's role to do research, write papers. I think particularly within this space, given the, the variety of different actors that we're working with, thinking about research as a much more kind of engaged actor within a change. So, um, you know, asking the right questions at the right time within the design of an initiative is often more important than having the answers. Getting people to question what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, so, as I said, I've read lots of proposals that come into MABC, and I just wanted to kind of talk through some of the common weaknesses that I've, that I've noticed. Um, you know, of course, the, there's some great things that come in. There is some stuff where you've got a real kind of rough diamond of an idea that, you know, over time might have significant impact in terms of governance. But many are very weak. Um, there's lots that don't really display a substantive understanding of the problem that they're looking to address. Um, 
many frame accountability problems is purely as an information gap. Um, and because, you know, essentially because the government doesn't know, doesn't have data or information about, you know, problems with service delivery or corruption, what have you, then nothing gets done about it. Um, very few engage in the politics of what's actually going on. They don't recognize the incentives, the disincentives, the capacities and agency to act. Um, there's no recognition of what government responsiveness actually looks like. So if you're not entirely sure what you're expecting to achieve, how can you be sure about when you're achieving it? Um, we also, so essentially we need to recognize the complexity. We need to recognize that accountability is political. We need to be a lot more realistic about what it might take to drive change. I then, I, the next thing I want to talk about is evidence. Um, many of the proposals that I've seen over the last three years don't really display any evidence that they've engaged in the evidence that already exists. You know, that yes, you know, five years ago, this, this field was kind of a bit light on evidence. But there, ev there is evidence that exists. But why aren't people engaging with it? Also, there's very little evidence regarding the outcomes and impacts of practitioners' own work. So you get a proposal and say, right, you know, we should be scaling this up to the next stage. But very little evidence of what kind of outcomes it's had so far. Has it proved a concept? of any description. Um, so there's an evidence problem. And in my mind, it's a problem with a number of different causes. Um, first off, how accessible is evidence? So we can talk about open access, what have you. But also, the language in which research is written can have a tendency to be inaccessible to a lot of people. Um, culture and ways of working. Um, some of the actors working in this space you know, seem to be very unfamiliar with working with research evidence, but instead are working in more kind of agile methodologies that rely very, very heavily on experiential learning. Um, and there's a tendency that towards more kind of single loop learning. Essentially, this is what we're going to do and learning about how we do that better, rather than double loop learning, which might be questioning, are we doing the right thing in the right place, in the, in the first place. Do we really understand the problem? Um, so there's those kind of issues. So I'm not arguing that, you know, single loop is better than double loop. All I'm saying is we need to be doing more of both. Um, another issue is about does the right evidence exist? That a lot of the work that practitioners are doing there's a sense that it's never been done before in, you know, in this sector, in this region, what have you. And so the trend, there's, there's an assumption that actually we can't learn from evidence that's been produced elsewhere. Um, or that um, essentially some, some practitioners have the assumption that you should be able to produce case studies that have very generalizable lessons that could be directly applied from a piece of research into the context that they're working in. You know, it's well known within governance work that context is king. So why should we assume that you can actually just transfer the, these kind of lessons? Um, so what's the answer? Um, you know, a question I've often heard, often despairingly, um, often by someone who's been struggling to make their way through the first couple of pages of a very academic report is, you know, how do we get researchers to write in ways which influence practice? You know, I, I've worked in research to policy, research to practice for many, many years in many different sectors. It's not a common problem. Um, but should we expect academics to be able to, and competent to communicate to a wide range of different actors, you know, is that realistic? You know, there are some good communicators. We've heard from some of them today. Um, but I think we need to accept that it's not realistic to expect 
a researcher who's very good at doing the research bit to necessarily be you know a communicator to all different actors um so essentially i think we need to be looking at perhaps more realistic theories of change of how research knowledge can then translate into change in practice and in policy and there is lots of work that's been that's been done in this area lots of communities doing lots of work around kind of knowledge mobilization knowledge brokering what have you and we need to look at the roles that these different actors play we need to invest more in research communications in knowledge brokering you know if if you think about open data right um you wouldn't expect the majority of people to engage directly with the data you're relying on skilled intermediaries to pull out the interesting stuff to translate that to contextualize it and communicate it it's the same with a lot of different forms of research um another thing donors should ask for evidence and they should reflect on the evidence that's being presented to them but similarly practitioners have a responsibility here that you know do your homework you know engage with the evidence that exists and expect to be challenged monitor whether what you're actually doing is producing the kind of outcomes you expect or don't expect are you actually you know is it feasible to assess the impact of what you're doing um and just leave you with a kind of overarching point is that you know governance it's a dynamic political and ongoing process of changing relationships and processes there's no fixing it you know the work you may do might improve things for a time it might just stop things getting worse for a time okay so thank you I mostly want to yield my introductory comments to hopefully some courageous questions from you all about why donors are so dysfunctional and hypocritical. I don't know um, if you saw in the U.S. there was a political scandal that Hillary Clinton was using a private server for her emails. And so as part of that, they had to publish all of the emails, or most of them, that were on the server. It's very interesting to read through, in part because I know some of the people who are writing these emails to her. And what really comes across super clearly is that everyone kisses Hillary Clinton's ass. So if you're Hillary Clinton, you know, even if the press writes horrible things about you, what's coming into your email inbox is a lot of ass kissing. And that's basically what it's like to be a donor. It's not comfortable. People don't speak to you honestly. Uh, and you know that people are saying negative things and lots of complaints in the hallways. So if there are people out here today who are willing to actually, you know, say what you say in the hallway to a panel of donors, that would be so refreshing. I would love to hear it. Thank you. Obviously, I'm going to rely on you guys to say what you say in the hallways <laughs> rather than me. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, some really interesting stuff there. Just a couple of points I picked up on. I was really touched by uh, Fran's point about you're the, the, the difficulty of in investing in this area without the equivalent of a Reuters or, or kind of lack of information makes it incredibly difficult. Lots of kind of rolling of the dice and kind of hoping uh, that these things will work. And just, just as Duncan touched upon, just about asking the right questions, you know, the, yeah, it, one thing from, from my commercial experience, we increasingly tried to get clients to maybe commit 30% of the budget up front to deliver the first part of the service, and then 70% of the budget would be based on the, the sustaining that project over time and learning from it. And if you're actually putting in a, a some kind of grant proposal, you're that especially when you have no idea what the outcome is going to be or how people are going to respond to that, there needs to be those kind of equivalent approaches. Um, and also just you know, the, 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 the duplication of effort is something that I guess I'm, I'm really keen to hear the, the panel's um, thoughts on about you know, when you see a proposal that comes in, it's clearly very similar to something that already exists, but maybe they're either not aware of it or... Again, what we are we suspect, certainly from what we see, is that as soon as someone has a bit of success in an area, lots of other people will also try and do the same thing because they might be able to kind of achieve success also. So rather than building on those efforts, you create a kind of a flattening out where just lots of people do the same thing. So I'd be really interested how the how you as a, a panel f respond to that when when you see that come in. And to David's point, I mean, you are the the the, the 
speaking honestly about giving the honest feedback. I, yeah, I think part of it, if I was being slightly defensive, I would say that there's not always the channels available for giving feedback. Often, if you don't get feedback why a, 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 a proposal has been rejected, it was just clearly some idiot at the foundation who didn't understand what you were trying to do. It couldn't possibly be any fault in the application you've just put in. So if there's no, if there's no kind of two-way channel for feedback, it, it's kind of difficult to kind of give the kind of the, the honest feedback back to the funder as well. Um, so what you're trying to get, it's often the case that you get the foot in the door with a funder, and then you're able to have your, your for instance, the, the, your fan and Indigo have been long-term funders and supporters of my society. There's a dialogue there. We can sit down and we can talk through issues and so on and think about you know, where our strategy is going and how we might wish to fund that in the future. And that's obviously a great relationship and the type of relationship you want any kind of funder and grantee to get to, but it's almost impossible up front. So maybe that first question just about you know, where, where you see duplication of effort, how do you respond to it? How do you push people in the right direction? And maybe as well about the kind of the two-way feedback, how do you address that? I don't know who wants to go first. Fran, perhaps? Thanks, although that's another classic example of saying nice things about funders. Um, on duplication of effort, it's really hard. We try and build up a lot of expertise within the trust to allow us to, to, to see duplication. And a big problem we have is great inspirational applications that say, we're going to build a new thing to do this. And far too often, they don't know that exactly the same platform exists as open source code in another country. So we, we really do encourage people to see if it's already been built, if it's available to use or adapt, and really prove the need for the genuinely new thing. Um, and it's something I think as funders we can all share examples of that uh, more often. Um, it's hard to do if you have expertise in one geography. I'm pretty confident on knowing what other projects exist across sub-Saharan Africa, but I don't necessarily know if it's already been built in the Philippines and could be replicated. Um, and it is one of the hardest things is to avoid getting caught up in excitement and hype. Um, at Indigo, we are very inspired by the projects we work with and you have to try and rule out a bit of the bias on that um, and not just be excited about it, but be very um, skeptical and cautious and sometimes paranoid to make sure it's not just an emotional response. We can't fund all the good applications we get. At some point, we have to make hard choices. And that's where it gets hard actually to feed back to unsuccessful applicants when sometimes the honest answer is, yours is a really good project, it's just maybe 1%, not quite as good as this other one we are going to fund. And um, I don't think we always get that right in telling people. In terms of duplicate projects, I think that sometimes it's OK to fund similar approaches to the same problem that use slightly different methodologies or are based in two different locations. Because there's a question of validity. Does, does something work? And then of gen, whatever that word is, generalizability? Uh, does it work in multiple places? And so I think sometimes that's fine. And sometimes I think that we're a little bit too polite and we're like, oh, come on, guys, we all have to do it together and sing kumbaya in the process. I think that we, we do, hopefully, I hope that my grantees think that I make an intentional effort to get people in the same room. Um, every organization thinks that the project that they are leading is the best one, has the best methodology, and the other ones aren't as good for X and X reason. And I found that when you get people together in a workshop setting where they're able to get away from their computers and dedicate three or four hours to say, okay, what are, what's our ultimate goal that we're striving for, and where does it make sense for us to complement each other and to get rid of certain aspects of the work where they're just clearly is duplication. It takes time because people have to fly to the same city and, and have this discussion, but usually I think it's worth it. And just to add on the duplication thing, um, if you look into some of the innovation literature, um, particularly looking at Andy Sterling's work on kind of innovation pathways approach, actually what he argues is you try and keep as many pathways open as possible. You know, you're trying to avoid getting locked in to particular technologies, particular approaches. So, you know, in some ways, you know, diversity is a good thing. So I'm keen to open it up 
to the floor. So we've got one, two, three. So I'll take maybe a couple of questions and then ask to respond. If you just say who you are and where you're from as well. So first question here. I think I was the first to put my hand up. So if you want to take someone on that side first. I'll... No, you, you're you're okay. holding the microphone, Rupert. Sure. Uh, Rupert Simons, Publish What You Fund. Um, this may be relevant to some of our funders on the panel. Um, what do you do uh, with organizations that you think um, are perhaps subscale or ought to merge or perhaps ought to be put out of business? Did that ever happen to you? How um, forceful are you in telling them that... Um, they need to merge, and if they do need to merge, what can you do to help them find suitable merger partners um, or, or even help them get taken over? Hi, this is Erhard Grave from the MIT Center for Civic Media. Uh, looking forward to this panel. And uh, I'd like to ask about what trends that you each see in uh, the acceptable forms of, of knowledge and impact uh, from funders that you see that your organization is now accepting and that you see other uh, funders in that space accepting? Where do you see that trend going in terms of acceptable forms of knowledge and where that's maturing? And the second part to that question is where you think your uh, you as a funder and your and your fellow funders are most missing the mark in the ways that you are framing M and E around civic tech right now. Hi, I'm Janet Lingan. I'm very interested in civic technology. Uh, I'm a consultant. Uh, something that I would like to hear a bit more, actually. Uh, you have talked about your work, the kind of work that you support. Uh, the kind of partners that you are looking for. Could you talk a bit more about how do you do your due diligence with the partners, especially in countries where you're not based? And I think that's very similar to what Rupert has asked about how do you decide who is uh, you, who are, you're going to support? Because from what I heard, it's like you're looking at the proposals and you know, up, uh, from that point, you could decide, make a decision. But how do you make sure that the partner that you are going to support has the legitimacy uh, beyond the skills and, you know, beyond the, the things that they are telling you in the proposal? Okay, so, we have three questions there. Um, so, so, what do you do to point out kind of uh, organizations which may be subscale or could be merged or collaborate together or even put out business? What trends do you see where there are kind of acceptable forms of impact and where is it most missing the mark? And how do you decide who to support? Obviously, rather than just throwing the proverbial dart into the dartboards, but maybe take any, all of those questions as you see fit. Thanks. I'd like to start with the due diligence question um, because it's something that concerns me a lot. We fund currently in 15 different sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and we're based in London, so we care about getting it right and trying to only fund where we can be an informed donor. So we've rejected some excellent applications just because they're from contexts where we don't know enough. They might be brilliant, but we won't be able to judge. Um, one thing we've ended up doing accidentally, although we sometimes pretend that it was very strategic, is funding innovation hubs in the countries where we work. So the hubs aren't necessarily their, their primary goal isn't transparency and accountability, but they become our partners in country to vet projects. And we find that we give them core funding for their work as a hub and their sustainability, and then have a relationship where they pass on what they think are the best local projects. So we rely on their knowledge of local context, but also on um, helping judge the tech skills of groups um, and how they work together. Um, although. Uh, I had a good critique of that, which said the people working in your average tech hub in the capital city of a developing country are not always up to date with every different problem in their own country. Um, so that's a big part of our due diligence, but we, we probably overload on informal due diligence. We talk to every single person that we can, um, and we try and collect as much information as possible to inform the decision rather than just relying on a, a formal application process to screen our risk. So I'm going to address two questions. Uh, our biggest failure in M&E as a sector, to the degree that we're a sector, and how to force mergers, encourage mergers, because I think that's a really interesting one. 
For our biggest failure in m and &E, my sense is that somehow over the past five years, there's been this trend where, compared to what we talked about this morning of how do people use these platforms and how do they benefit from these platforms, our sector, and I think the, open, the success of the open government partnership is partly responsible for this, has really been focused on creating standards, creating norms, you know, going to conferences, meeting with different people and saying, what, is the, what type of data do we want to see available? And then we all create indices to see what degree is that data available, and then we fund case studies to see what is open data and open government good for. And that's one approach to impact, is to say, we're building all of these things, what do they do? But it's very much looking for the nails with the hammer, compared to saying, what is a concrete problem that you're trying to resolve, such as more access to water in this particular county in Kenya, and then working backward, and what are the roles of transpar transparency, participation, and accountability in reaching that goal? Maybe those aren't the key things. Maybe it's the government that needs to do better use search uh, user, user research, uh, it could be a lack of state funding, it could be a lack of state c capability, but I think our big problem is that we're always leading with the hammer and looking for nails all across the world. Uh, for mergers, what, I mean, we have a, I would say the, the benefit of where we stand, we have a good panoramic view over what a, how a lot of organizations operate and the individuals in each of those operations. And lots of times it is particular individuals within operations who are really thought leaders, they're leading pieces of work, they're leading particular projects. And we can see how, wow, if this one organization or if these three people in that organization could just partner with these two people in that organization, they'd be able to do something incredible. We're not able to force that. But a lot of what I do beyond just pushing papers and responding to emails is kind of playing like an OkCupid okay type role and trying to set people up. There's a limit. We can stop funding an organization and maybe that will incentivize that organization to partner with another one. We can't force a marriage, but I think that we can, we can nudge people toward it and there have been some good examples of that. Um, I'm not gonna respond to that one. Um, on the due diligence question, um, essentially, we just go out and talk to people. Um, we have staff in all the countries that we're operating in, um, almost. Um, so that's how we deal with it. And at the end of the day, we make a decision within an investment committee, but that's... It's, whether we make a decision to say, yes, let's go ahead, that there's, it's quite a long route to then kind of finally agreeing the contract, issuing cash. You know, what you'll get from the investment committee um, in a lot of cases is this needs strengthening in these different ways. How are you going to respond to that? And, and then you go from there. Okay, we'll take three more questions and then I think that's probably all we've got time for. I know there was one chap here right at the front who had his hand up. Then we'll go uh, this chap here and then any uh, any more female voices, actually? We've got a lot of male hands up. One from Meven there as well. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Benjamin from uh, Regard Citoyen in France. Uh, I want to answer David's uh, point uh, from earlier on. Uh, I want to express a frustration. Uh, I understand the need to measure, assess, uh, have a very strong uh, project that are detailed and such, but <laughs> submitting a call for a grant is very, very time consuming. Uh, building a budget is something that some people are not used to do. Uh, specifying everything takes a lot of time. And for an NGO that doesn't already have someone dedicated to that or doesn't have even anyone being paid for, then it's really hard and it's in most of the time unbearable. Uh, my NGO is seven years old. We have we do parliamentary monitoring, adv open data advocacy, political transparency advocacy, lobbying. Uh, we successfully got yesterday uh, stopped uh, the trade secrets uh, on open data that the Senate wanted to add, uh, expelled. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of the things. We are all volunteers. We are eight. Uh, we all do that at nights and weekends. We are all a bit exhausted. <laughs> uh, we all have jobs. So. I'm wondering, I mean, uh, Tom Steinberg wrote a great uh, piece last week uh, on that, saying civic tech society needs to acknowledge that sometimes they cannot make money. It's just even by crowdfunding and such, they will never make enough to fund 
a position or such. And I don't think that's bad. I mean, it's democratic projects. So they're not made to make money. <laughs> Makes sense. So I just want to ask how to address this, how to fund projects that already prove they can do much without money, but won't take the time to just, I mean, when we got spare time, we'd rather do things than just spend hours on making a project that we're not even sure it will be accepted. So how to do that? And maybe another approach would be for you guys to just assess everybody and see what, what can be done. Hi. Um, so this is not a frustration, but more like a pub chat thing. Um, <laughs> so is when you fund nonprofits and civic tech projects that aren't sustainable and can do have a business model, um, is the funding is like donate donating to them in that way potentially inherently combative um, and causing conflict? Because you have to prove that the impact that you have made in the world is your impact when actually it might make more sense if a lot of people worked together and created a larger impact. And is, is doing that one-on-one -on -one model thing actually bad for the ecosystem as a whole? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really from the civic tech world, so it's a bit new to me, but... Um, but you did ask for some sort of arguably critical feedback on fundraising. So I've been a, s a political activist for 30 years off and on. And um, one of the f I'm at the moment, I'm a researcher in London. And my observation is that the people are doing the most interesting, uh, innovative work in terms of social and political design aren't actually funded because they can't get funding because they're too political. Um, and I recently did a conference where... Um, are called uh, uh, bottom-up political participation. So I asked lots of organizations to come to it. Quite a significant minority wouldn't come to it because they couldn't be seen to be political. So, you know, I'd like to be devil's advocate and suggest that the, the funding sort of system skews, skews innovation. So the guys that are doing really interesting stuff can't get the money and the people doing not so interesting stuff have got the money, and this creates all sorts of problems. If you're not aware of it, it does. <laughs> so I, I guess three very similar questions, really, about you know, the, the, in relation to how does does uh, important work, or potentially important work, get funded when there's just not a model there to do it, and uh, just as as even pointed out around the does the competitive aspect is that a help or a hindrance within this? Does it, it exploit stuff? And obviously the kind of political aspect to this as well. So three different interpretations on a similar question, I think. Um, I want to answer all those questions, but I'm gonna try and narrow it down. Um, on the point about political activism, it is really hard. It's not always solely the fault of funders. We are bound by charity law, certainly in the UK, um, and particularly in a lot of African countries where if something is a particular type of political activity, we are not allowed legally to fund it charitably. Cross-party stuff is easier. Stuff that is improving the entire democratic process is easier. Stuff that is party-related, certainly in the UK, is not allowed to be charitable funding. Um, I think with Indigo, we go very close to the line in some countries. But as I said earlier, we're not going to fund something if we're putting the activists at risk. And that's a real risk in those countries. Um, but having said that, I wish there was more funding available generally for things that really challenge the political system. Um, it's not a space that a lot of funders want to go to. I wish there was more of it. Um, on the combative part, um, whenever you're dealing with individual organizations, there is going to be some element of that. It's not deliberate. Um, but if an organization can't in any way point to its own role in the change that's happening, rather than just a change that maybe the result of many, many different partners, then how can we know that we should continue funding them? Um, that's why we try and look at proxies. You don't have to prove that you brought down a government, but if no one has used your project, then it's unlikely you did play a role in it. Um, on the, the very good point about what is basically volunteer effort and sometimes slave labor by amazing projects, um, 
We fund people because their skill is what they're doing, not because they're experts at writing a budget. But we have to give money to projects we think have a chance of succeeding. And even if you're never going to be profitable, and most Indigo projects will never at all be profitable, we have to have some inkling that you might still exist in a year. So if you can't in any way show that you've thought through where future funding might come from, we will be very worried that you won't exist to fund again in a year. So we're very flexible on how we look at budgets, but um, if we think there are no other funders apart from us who would fund you, even if we love your work, we don't think you'll survive beyond us and we can't fund organisations forever. So there is an element where we have to look at sustainability, even if it's just that you can show there is a wide variety of other charitable donors who might be interested in what you do. And hopefully we can grow the pool of funders who understand this work so that there are more chances for your work. Um, in terms of funding institutions that sometimes do the same work compared to, and if that is detrimental to collective action across many different actors, and that's a very helpful comment for me. I wrote something down that the best proposals that I get are the ones that describe who are all of the actors in this work that we're proposing in terms of civil society, in terms of the users, in terms of the so-called beneficiaries who have, whose lives actually make a difference, and then within government. I mean, I think something that we've certainly learned in the evidence over the past few years, and this was emphasized in the opening governance bulletin that IDS put out recently, is that the best projects are those that have that are aligned with state reform from within government and have champions from wi within government. So those proposals that recognize upfront, yes, we know that there are five other organizations doing very similar work and here's how we collaborate with them are by far the best ones. And I think that we can do a better job requesting that information in the proposal process. Um, how to approach that. Um, I, I, the, the, the contribution thing I think that you know there's m and &E approaches for for looking at contribu contribution versus attribution so you know there's methods for deal dealing with that on the point about funding kind of more informal types of work this kind of work that's been done looking at you know supporting social movements it's really difficult um, one of the pieces of work that MABC has funded um, it was essentially funding an action research piece where a researcher was working with a social movement in Kenya and we didn't know what we were going to get out of it. It was an exploration of the issues, the tensions within the social movement. And it's been really, really useful and valuable to them. And I think, you know, framing things in a more action researchy, learning focused approach can help you get around some of the kind of potential barriers in, in, in proposal writing. Because you, what you're saying is, we're exploring this question. You're not pro promising particular kind of outcomes. So. Excellent. Fantastic panel. Thank you so much. I know there's probably more questions, but round of applause, first of all. Thank you.